We are in a series, we're talking about what it is to be a disciple. Our, our mission statement here is love God, love people, make disciples. So if we're going to make disciples, uh, let's begin laying that foundation on what is a disciple. What does a disciple look like? And, and last week we began talking about what it is for us as, as believers uh, to become disciples. God begins this transformational process uh, in you. I mean, think about this. What makes us distinctive from all other people as believers? What makes us distinctive? I mean, it's, it's not our uh, ethnicity, our background there. It's not our social economic status. It's not our, our education or how much money we make. What makes us distinctive is that God has saved us, He's redeemed us, and He is transforming us. He gives us a new name, a new identity. And it's, it's an identity that is one that only He can grow us into. It's one that only He can do. And the thing is, is that this process that He does it is over time. Uh, you are the already not yet. Okay, we should get t-shirts, right? <laughs> already not yet, right? Uh, when you come to Christ, boom, you are a new creation, okay? Your salvation is set in Christ. Now, at that point, God begins a work in you. You are not yet what he intends you to fully become, but you are already what he wants you to become. I know, you're like, huh? We're going to talk about this. We're going, to, we're going to dig into this. Because this is all about how God transforms us, how he is at work in us. And I love this. This is a point from last week. But it's so critical for us to understand that God sees in us what we cannot see in ourselves. That God sees in you what you cannot see in yourself. And I love the fact that he is not limited by our weaknesses and our, and our own inabilities. He is not limited by our imperfections because of who he is. And so God is at work in you now as that disciple, as that believer in Christ. Now here's the thing. Us growing in this transformation... Uh, is going to take a different mindset. That's why uh, uh, there in Romans 12, he tells us, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've, you've got to begin to think and see yourself differently than God does. And you've got to begin to think and look at your walk differently than how it's kind of ingrained in us to do. We are achievement and performance driven, are we not? I mean, it is all about to do. How many of you have to-do lists and you check things off, right? Right? And how many of us, when we don't accomplish stuff, we feel like failures? And, and that flows over into our walk and our relationship with God. And we're just like, man, I've got to be doing. I've got to be doing. And, and this just drives us. But see, God's economy is not an achievement-based economy. God is not about you trying to run yourself into the ground, do, do, doing. He's about you resting in Him. And when it comes to the transformation in your life, it's one that He is doing. I mean, I get this. I, I'm wired to do. And, and I think we all wrestle with this. How many of you, like, if you have a week where you do the do's and you don't do the don'ts, you think God loves you just maybe a little more? Doesn't He like you just a little bit better? As opposed to the weeks where you mess up and you're just kicking yourself because you know that it hadn't been a good week, you know, and you're just like, I don't think God likes me as much today, right? Because you have the wrong view of who God is. God is perfect in his love. He is unchanging. His love for you never wavers. It never changes. I get why you think that way. I can think that way. That's because that's how we love, right? You do right by me, 
I'm going to like you better. You do what I don't want you to do. Yeah, don't come around me. Don't be talking to me, man. Talk to the hand. I'm not yet, right? That's how we think God is towards us. And he's not, church. He loves you with such a depth of love. That's why he's constantly at work in you, drawing you to himself, changing you, transforming you. And this is what we're looking at. How does God grow you? How does he work in you? Last week, we were looking there at Matthew 5, where God calls us salt and light. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. How many of you feel like salt and light? Right? I mean, if we're based on feeling, on a scale of 1 to 5 or 1 to 10, how do you feel about that? Right? You'd be like, no, I'm this week, I was a 3 maybe. You know, that's when I set myself on fire. Right? <laughs> I was like, hey, I'm the light of the world, put me out. All right? Um, we tend to just let that, our performance, weigh on us. Because God gives us a new identity, a new name, and we feel like we don't live up to it. But listen, church, God is transforming you and growing you. He is the one responsible in your life to change and transform your heart. He does what you cannot do. That's the work that He does. He does what you cannot do. Last week we were talking about how he does this process. How does he work in your life and work that transformation? One of the primary ways that God works that transformation in our life as believers is through, look around, other believers. All right, look around the room. God uses other people. This is what he calls us to do. He calls us to walk in relationship with others so that we have others speaking into our life. We have others building us up. And encouraging us, that's why this is so crucial for you to be a part of a smaller group of believers. Those who would would help hold you accountable, to give you that support and encouragement. But, But even more important than them pouring into you is you having opportunity to pour into others. I know some of us are like, you know, I'm just not that mature in my walk. You know what? It doesn't take a lot of maturity to say, hey, how are you doing? How can I pray for you? All right? See, if, let me just say this. If you come to church for what you can get, you are often going to leave disappointed. You, if you come and that's your purpose, okay, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to see what I can get out of the sermon. I'm going to see what I can get. You're going to leave disappointed. Because that's not how God's economy works. Now, if you come to church ready to give, ready to give your heart and worship, God, I'm going to go there, and you know what? I'm just going to give myself. I'm going to give my heart to you. I'm going to give my heart and worship. I'm going to give my heart and loving the people that I come across, that I meet in church. I'm going to speak encouragement. I'm going to say hi. I'm going to, you know, ask how they're doing. I'm going to give myself like that. Do you know what happens you actually get back. That's, that's how God's economy works. That's, that's why he calls us to, to come together as the body of Christ and to, to build one another up. And so as you put in your life opportunities, he's going to grow you and transform you in that. Now I want to go to one of our key texts this morning. It's going to be in 2 Corinthians. And I want to dig into this because we're going to keep talking about how God transforms us and changes us. So we're going to be in 2 Corinthians there in chapter 3. Let me just kind of lay a little groundwork here. As Paul is talking about a veil here in this text. And he's talking about this veil that is, basically it's what we would understand, this veil that kind of blinds us before we come to Christ. It's this veil, it's, it's sin, and sin, sin clouds our understanding. It clouds our understanding of God and who He is, and it, it, it kind of, it's hard for us to see or to get or to understand who God is. And so there's this, this veil, and then when an individual comes to Christ and says, I, I surrender my life to you, then Paul says this veil is removed. It's removed. So not only does does salvation 
happen. Not only is that person saved from sin, but also from the, the, the ignorance that his or her sin created in their life. It's like God removes this veil, and then he begins this transformational work in you. Look at the text here in your Bibles. If you need a Bible, look under the, the seat in front of you, and if you don't own one, please take that one. It says, but when one turns to the Lord... The veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Okay, so he's saying that that this veil is is like sin, and sin is bondage. And, And when the Lord comes in, where the Lord is, there's freedom. Because he takes away that sin, he takes away that veil. And it says, and we all... With unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. I want to put this up on the screen. I want to read back through this. I'm going to read it in the um, New Living Translation. It's a paraphrased version. And it's one that, that maybe as I read it, you'll, you'll connect uh, with the language just a little bit more. Let me read this again. Paul says, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit. (laughs) And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious Image. So what he's talking about is when this veil of sin, when we come to Christ, this veil of sin where we were once blinded, now we can see. All of a sudden, spiritual things begin to make sense where before they didn't. This is why, this is why you hear the terms like Jesus used to be, to be born again. Or as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, that we're new creations. It's like you have your spirit, was, you were spiritually dead. No life. Christ comes in and gives you new life, gives you a new spirit, a new nature, a new identity. And so what before was just like a cloud to you, now you're just like, oh, oh. I mean, you talk to any pastor, it is so much fun uh, when we get to walk through uh, Scripture with new believers. Because they're just like, I never got that before. I never understood that. We're like, I know, isn't it cool? And they're like, yeah, right? I mean, we love this. And so there's this new identity, this new transformation that's happening in our life. And he says that, that you begin to understand and know God deeper and deeper. And that's why he uses that term from, from glory to glory. In other words, God's doing a work in you. It is a step-by-step by step, by step. You know him today, you're going to know him a little deeper tomorrow, right? A little deeper, a little deeper. And it's not like, rarely do we ever plunge dive in life. He takes us through transition. And, and, and that's what he's doing in your life. He's growing you. And, and he's saying this, this growing, this transformation happens when you behold the glory of God. I find that such interesting terminology, the glory of God. Now, if you grew up in church, you've heard, obviously, probably, the words, the phrase, the glory of the Lord, the glory of God, glorifying God, glorifying the Lord. Keith uses it. We just used it today. You know, we're here to give glory to God. Um, So now, let's say... It's third service out at El Caraton, which I know many of you go to, right? And somebody comes up to you and they say, would you please define the glory of God? How would you define it? Isn't it, isn't it one of those things where you're just like, uh, could I get some cheese dip? <laughs> you know, it's like, we're just, we're not sure what to say. Well, we'll know this. See, God's glory far exceeds anything that that you and I can fully comprehend. 
Just know that. But we will still attempt here this morning to give it some definition, something that we can kind of sink our teeth into as we learn to understand it. Because as, as what Paul is saying is this, this glory of God that transforms us and changes us. So that's why we need to kind of get an idea and understand what it is. So let me give you this definition on the glory of God. It's the beauty that emanates from his character from all that he is. Okay? It's the beauty that emanates from his character from all that he is. So it's a beauty that can crown man. It's a beauty that can fill all of the earth. It's a beauty that's seen within man. It's a beauty that's seen within creation. It's not, it's not a beauty that's of them. It's of God. Understand, God's glory is for God alone. You understand that? We sing songs in church or we say phrases, to God be the glory. All glory, all power, you know, is yours. We say those things. We're not sure exactly what they mean sometimes. But understand that God gets absolutely all glory because of who he is. His glory is something that never passes away. It's eternal. It's alive in all of his attributes. I like Matt Chandler's definition. He said, the glory of God is the singular splendor of God and its consequences for humankind. So it's the singular splendor of God and its consequences for humankind. Here's what I want you to understand about the glory of God. You and I were made for the glory of God. Flat out, that's what he tells us in Isaiah 43. God says, everyone who was called by my name, whom I created for what? My glory, whom I formed and made. Every one of us is made for God's glory. And God is glorified. See, he made you in his image to reflect who he is. And he's glorified by that. When, when, when people can see in you his grace, his love, his compassion, when you reflect that. I was thinking of the, the Westminster Catechism. The chief end of man is this, to please God and to glorify him. We have this glory of God placed in us. We're created in his image. Paul referred to it like this. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. See, we are these vessels, of these jars of clay. And you as a believer possess the very presence, the very spirit of God. So everything that we're able to do, everything that we're able to be, everything about you, your source is in Him and Him alone. And so our lives are to be that mirror, that reflection of the glory of God. In the same way, in the same way, church, that, that God reflects His glory in creation. How many of you like to go out into nature? Anybody like to just go out and like, and I don't know if it's at the ocean or, uh, I mean, I do a cruise, you know, I'm up for cruises. I, I could really appreciate God's glory on a cruise at the buffet line. Um, but, uh, I mean, we have different ways, things. God uses nature to reveal and to display His glory. And it's something we connect. I mean, when, when you see just beautiful landscapes, right, that, that creation that is all around you is part of God's common grace. That means that you don't have to be a Christian to appreciate the beauty of creation. God puts this evidence of who He is. He surrounds us with it, right? So when we go to different locations, we're just like, oh man, I, I love this. I love this. C.S. Lewis says that nature creates a longing in the soul of man it cannot fulfill. So creation all around us, that's God's common grace. You cannot even believe in God and still be in awe of all that is around you. It gets your attention. And, and I'm always amazed, you know, as science progresses, and so I was just looking this up, and so through those electromagnetic microscope things, you know, you guys know what that is? Pollen. 
I'm like, no wonder my eyes water and my nose itches. And, you know, I'm like, look at those prickly things. But then I start looking at it and I'm just like, look at the design on that. And that, man, that is mind boggling. Or you jump the opposite way and you go to the Hubble telescope that, that just shoots out and all those little light dashes you see there are complete galaxies, whole galaxies. And, and I think about that, and I'm like, you know, the, the writer, when he penned the words, the heavens declare the glory of God, when he wrote that, he had no comprehension at the expanse of the universe that God spoke into being. And there's a reason, because even that's a display that says, you know what, God is far greater than what you and I can ever begin to comprehend. But all of this, all of this, Creation reflects His glory. It's a reflection of, of who He is. That the, the God's glory, think of it like this, God's glory, there's a weight to it. There's a weight to it. There is a, a, a thickness. There's a presence. It's, it's His power. It's His might. It's how He displays, put on display His very character, His nature, is throughout all creation. So that, so that those who are like, I don't know if, if, God, I don't know if you're there. God's like, look around you. Look around you. And it is to draw us to himself. His glory is displayed in creation. Let me, let me point out another place, and this is going to be really uh, important for us to understand. His glory is displayed in his holiness. Okay? I, want, I want you to start chewing on this this morning. The glory of God okay, is that ethical plumb line. The glory of God is that standard by which we will all be judged. Okay? The glory of God is that which we will all, it's by that glory we will all be judged. This is what Paul is talking about in Romans when he says, For all have sinned and fall short of what? The glory of God. See, we find ourselves in a predicament. If you go to Psalm 24, I love Psalm 24. David uh, kind of pins that predicament that we, we find ourselves in in Psalm 24. I'm going to put up just verses uh, 3 through 4 for us here. David says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy presence? And, and he's saying, Who's going who's gonna to go up this hill to where God is? Who's going to go stand in the presence of this ferociously holy God? It, it, the scripture describes God as a consuming fire. And, and what that means is, is that the holiness of God is such that if anything comes within the presence of His holiness, it is instantly consumed if it is unholy. Pretty fearful thing. This is why you read in Scripture like when Isaiah comes before God and, and the first thing he does is hit the ground. He says, woe is me, for I am a sinner. He instantly recognizes his predicament. As all of us should. David recognized that because he's like, who's going to go up? Who's going to go up this hill? Who's going to go and stand in the presence of God? And then there in verse 4, he answers it. He says, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. So just in case you're wondering, all of us just got disqualified. None of us are going to get up that hill. None of us. In fact... All of humanity has fallen short. That's what he says. All have fallen short of the glory of God. So we find ourselves in this impossible situation. Let me explain this to you. And I explained, I was thinking about this, you know. We need to know the gospel and understand the gospel if we are going to share the gospel. So understand this. All of us have imputed sin. And, and what that means is, is we are born with a sin nature, okay? When, when Adam sinned, death entered the world, and death reigns in all of us. 
So we are a broken people. Every single one of us here. We come into the world broken. Parents, I don't have to tell you, your child does not bend toward righteousness and goodness. Right? So I was in the, I was in the store earlier this week and, and met a young mom there. And she had a little girl. She must have been about three. You know, she's talking now. You know, the danger of that when your three-year-old's talking. Right? And I was just visiting with her mom. And the little girl looks at me and she says, Mommy, I don't like him. I was like, what? And, and she's like, I don't like you. I mean, that took me, I was just like shocked. I mean, who doesn't like me? So, you know, I stuck my tongue out at her. I shoved her and, <laughs> and then I ran out the store, right? I know you don't believe that because you're like, you don't run. <laughs> but I'm just saying there's, there's things that are just sewn into us. You know, from a young age, our kids are not bent towards that. And you know what? That brokenness, that brokenness continues on in our life. We see it grow in just personal sin. You have sins of omission and sins of commission. You know, is what scripture talks about where where we know the things that are right, but we don't do them. And we know the things that are wrong and we choose to do them. And all of us are guilty of all those things. So here's what we need to nail down. Here's what you have to understand. God absolutely hates sin. Any image that you might come up with where God is like okay with sin and where God is like, it's just a little sin, you do not understand who God is. He has absolute hatred for any sin. Imputed, personal, omission, sins of commission, He has white hot wrath against that sin and he will destroy all sin. Here's the the thing. God loves us. He loves us with such an intensity and a depth of love. Here's the other part of love that I want you to get and understand. With love comes the possibility of wrath. Okay? Okay? Sometimes we don't like to talk about God being a God of wrath. But if you are going to talk about God being uh, perfect in his love, you have to understand he also has wrath. Parents, this is true of you. You love your child. You let somebody pick on your kid. If somebody starts hurting your child, I mean like actually hurting your child, your child is crying out saying, Mommy, Daddy, help me. What are you going to do? You're going to be right there. And you're going to see the possibility of wrath coming up. Because you're like, whoa, no you don't. Do you understand that the absence of wrath is the absence of love? And God has such a depth of love for us. And has such a hatred of sin. Because God sees the destructiveness of sin. He sees how it just wreaks havoc on his creation. That, that all that he created to bring glory to, and, and to see life is affected by sin that just brings pain and death and what God intended for there to be joy for his people. And so you have to understand he absolutely hates sin. If you want to understand his seriousness about sin, just look at the cross. Look at the death of Jesus on the cross. It is not pleasant. I don't need to go into detail of it, but suffice to say, understand this, that it was on that cross that Christ bore your sin and mine in God's wrath and full hatred against sin was poured out on his son. What was deserved for you and I, what we should have gotten, God poured out on his son. 
That's the intensity to which God hates sin. That's the degree to which God loves you. And all of this so that you and I could know and experience the glory of God and his presence. See, this has always been the goal. I mean, the, the, the problem that is always that, that God had to address was how does God get you and I, who are sinful, into heaven without God compromising who he is? That's been the problem that God had to address. And, and, and he addressed that through Jesus. See, God's glory, his presence is what he has intended to have in your life from the beginning. Let me just walk you through this a little bit. Back up. We're going to go through the entire Old Testament this morning. Right? We should be done by supper. Right? <laughs> Uh, now, let me, just, let me just start back here a little bit, because I like to lay this foundation on the glory of God. So when we read the Old Testament, uh, we see the very presence of God. Uh, in the Old Testament, it's referred to as the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah glory. That is the presence of God. And it was there from the beginning when the Spirit hovered over the waters. You saw the very presence of God um, in uh, the burning bush, remember Moses in the burning bush? That was that, was that Shekinah glory, that presence of God. Uh, when God brought Israel out of Egypt and there was that pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire at night, that was the presence of God. When they built the tabernacle, that, that tent, uh, you had the very presence of God, that, that cloud that dwelled over it, stayed over it for 40 years. Um, when Solomon uh, built the temple... There in Jerusalem, you had the presence of God come in, in in such a way that it says the priest could not even enter the temple because the presence of God, the Shekinah glory was so thick, they could not enter in. So see, God from the beginning has desired his presence to be among men. But it's not just to dwell in a building. His design from the beginning has been that the very presence of God would dwell within man. Now, interestingly, if you study the Old Testament, what you see happen is Israel rebels. They turn their backs on God. And it says in Ezekiel 10 that the very presence of God leaves the temple. He actually sees the presence of God leave the temple. And then the Babylonian army comes in. The temple is destroyed. Israel is carried off into captivity. Then eventually, Nehemiah comes back. They rebuild the temple. And you know what? The presence of the Lord never returns to that building. Never returns. Now, why is that? Because God has a bigger plan than just for his presence to be in a building. Right? The next time you see the presence of the Lord, you got to fast forward and leap all the way to the New Testament where you have John the Baptist declaring that the kingdom of God is at hand and the glory of the Lord is in our midst. And who is he talking about? Jesus. He is the manifest presence of the glory of God. Now see, God has not just come in the form of a midst, a cloud of thunder and lightning, now he is one of us. And the glory of God is in our midst. Emmanuel, God with us. Right? So the very presence of God is, is in our midst. John in his gospel says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen what? His glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And the writer in Hebrews is speaking about Jesus and he says, He is the radiance of the glory of God. He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. This is interesting. He says, After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty 
on high. We see the manifest presence of God, the glory of God, come in Christ. And then he, these words that, that he speaks, God does something here, I think, that is unique. Because again, God's intention is not that his presence is going to dwell in some building or in some place outside of us. It's to dwell within us. So what does he do here? It says that Jesus, after making purifications for sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. you got to love that. Jesus finished the work, and he went over, and he sat down. Next time he gets up, he's coming back here. I hope he's standing up right now. <laughs> I'm ready, right? But it says that, that he finished that work. You have to understand the work that he did, he finished. He completed. What was the work? Let me just share a couple of scriptures for you. This is what God says. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Okay, you understand that? That's what God did. He took Christ, who had no sin, and he made him sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In Galatians 3, he says that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. You understand the work that he's doing? Let me, let me read a, a further text here. In, in, turn in your Bibles, go to Romans 3. Okay, Look there at verse 23. Because this was, this was our condition. This was the big problem. Romans 3.23. And it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now let me, if you don't have this marked in your Bible, this is a great passage to mark. Because look at what God does here in verses 24 through 26. I'm going to put it up on the screen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it from the, the New Living Translation. And just soak this in. It says, Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. The sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. Now understand, so Christ's sacrifice on the cross covered sin past, present, and future. That's the work that he did. And it says God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just. And he declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. This is the gospel, Christ in our place. That's what you have to remember. What is the gospel? Christ in our place. Because So here it is. Because, because of what Christ did on the cross, now the very Spirit of God dwells within you as a believer. This is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, now takes residence in you. And He is at work in you, changing you, transforming you. Let me go back to our original text right there at the beginning. Oh, I didn't. There we go. In 2 Corinthians 3.18. So all of us, who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory, the glory of God. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Okay, now, and, and I know I've talked a lot this morning, but I'm a pastor. That's what we do. We talk a lot. Um, but I hope one of the things that you've gleaned as we've looked at, at the text in all the work that's been done for our salvation, for our growing us, for our transformation of us, for our changing us, uh, who did the work? Did you see anything in there where you did the work? Uh, no, you didn't, unless you have a false Bible, right? You won't find anything in there where you did the work. God does the work. God does the transformation. So here's one of the things that I kind of chew on. So if God is the one responsible for your salvation, 
He's the one responsible for your new identity. He is the one responsible for the transformation of you, right? What are you supposed to do? I mean, do you ever wonder that? It's like, well, I got to do something. I should be doing something, right? You know what our responsibility is? Is to set our heart on him. It sounds easy. Easier said than done. God wants you to look to him. You put your eyes on him. You put your focus on him. You know what? I say, God, I need, you to, I need you to change me. I need you to transform me. I can't do this. You can. And so I continually look to him. And that's what God tells us. He points this out all through scripture. You look to me. You fix your eyes on me. You're not the holy one. I am. You're not perfect. I'm perfect. You're not the mighty one. I am. You're not the one who spoke everything into creation. I am. You're not the one who's going to complete the work that I began in you. I am. What you do is look to me because I am the author and perfecter of your faith. See, what Paul is telling us is it's the glory of God. His presence in our life. God changes us and transforms us from glory to glory to glory. And here's the thing. God intends to be on display in your life. Is he? Is he on display in your life? I love the fact that, you know what, when it comes to creation, we can go outside and look at the stars And see how the stars display his glory just by being who God created them to be. They're not doing anything up there other than doing what they were made to do. You know what? When it comes to us, it's not about all the stuff we can be doing for God. It's just putting our focus on him where God has put us and letting him do the work and transformation. What he wants from you, church, what he wants from you is a heart that says, okay, God, You change me like you want. I need you to change my heart. How many of you got stuff in your life right now? You know there's stuff in your heart that you know uh, this doesn't glorify God. This, This doesn't please God. God, I need you to change me. And that's what he wants. He wants a heart that says, okay, God, I'm trusting you to do it and make my heart pliable. Make it, God, if I have a hard heart, soften it. Do whatever it takes. That's the heart that God's looking for. That's the heart of a disciple. We're going to close this morning. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. And I would just ask you this morning, is there an area of resistance right now in your life? God wants to do that work he's completing in you and he's drawing you to himself and sometimes we can kind of drag our feet and put that resistance up and God's like quit resisting is his glory on display in your life if there's areas where you're like this is not pleasing God God I need to change this then give that to him give that to him as we close we're going to close in a time of worship because God created us for worship You know what, this space up here, it's always a space of prayer. It's a place of worship. It's a a place of life markers. And and if there is anything you need to surrender to him, then do that. Whether it's your life, your heart, whether it's an area, an issue, don't put that off. Don't put that off. Set your eyes and your heart on him. Would you stand with, with me and let me close this in prayer?